Welcome back to the Michael Edwards Show. Today, I am joined by the icon himself, my good friend, Chris, who is a pop star, a manifesting icon, the holder of the Celebrity Frequency, an entrepreneur. He was named a top entrepreneur by Forbes. He has such an influential voice. He is the leader of I don't even know what to call it. Just like this new generation way of being is to what it means to me. Chris, you have been such an impact on my life. I feel like every time we speak, I just get some code from you that that impacts my life so beautifully and so amazingly. I'm so thrilled to have you here today. Welcome. Oh my God, it's such an honor to be on the Michael Edwards show. Like how spicy and sexy and fabulous. So I'm just honored and thrilled to be here and to be sharing in your light as well. Amazing. Amazing. And so you're very new to me in terms of we just met, you know, in the 3D more recently, but I sort of get this feeling that you just arrived at being you in a way. And if that's true, can you tell us? And I want to know, how did you become sort of Chris, the icon that you are? Oh my gosh. Well, yes, that's so funny because I feel like We've known each other only like a year or in earth years, but like our souls have known each other for 10,000 years. So it's funny. We definitely were like soul family when we just met. Basically, oh no, that's totally not the case. It's been a human trajectory of unlearning, of expansion in order to be more in alignment with the version that I am right now. And just here in this moment, just like to add color to what Michael you're saying is, you know, I drive a pink Mercedes. I'm friends with Paris Hilton. I, you know, have my own marketing company. I'm a a manifestation coach and also a pop star. And so on the exterior, it seems, oh, I'm just very fully expressed. And, you know, I'm standing in that divine beingness and that power. But truly, I feel like just being vulnerable. It's been at least a three decade journey (laughs) of learning to love myself and to, you know, come into that true nature of who I am, loving awareness, and to see Chris, this shell that I have with through the eyes of love and through God's eyes of of adornment and adoration. And so I think that it's definitely through the spiritual awakening journey that I've been on, I've come into more integrity of of who I want to be and who God has called me to be. And that unfoldment, you know, hopefully gets to inspire other people. I love that you talked about vulnerability and integrity, because I think that's the thing that makes knowing you feel so different than like someone else who on the surface may appear to have some of the things, but it's like a very, it's, I feel like it's a very different experience of the human being. Can you talk a little bit about what those two things mean to you and what your journey has been with them? Yeah, I I really, an example that I use before I go into myself is, is why people feel so connected to Oprah is Oprah has this depth. She has this uh, richness and this texture to the things she says. So she's not just a host or a broadcaster. She's able to hold the space for the brilliance of others to shine. And the reason why she can do that is because she's so emptied herself. She's done the work. You know, she's learned how to get close to her own heart. And I think that I've gone through that similar journey and I'm still on that journey of learning to get close to Chris's, to my own heart. So we know that the soul's journey is to experience love and it's we are our true identity as consciousness experiencing love through itself. And so, you know, I've had to go through just even my lived experience, right? It's provided me a tapestry of challenges to transcend. So, you know, obviously being a queer person of color, a lot of my identity has been entangled with shame, just not enoughness. You know, I'm a music artist and Part of what inspired me to become a music artist is, is that I wanted to tell my own versions of love and my own love stories to the world through music. And I had to go through a, a long journey of putting music out, taking it down. Like I got a record deal and I would still like release music and then take it off the internet because I'd gone through this like tug of war of does my stories matter? Do I matter? Does my love story have any value? Does, does Chris have any value by expressing himself? And so I think that is something very relatable. We all go through a version of that. And I think that to your point, part of what's helped me navigate my shadow, you can call it that, or just sort of learn to love the parts of Chris's fragmented inner child that honestly had to protect himself or, you know, shield himself from love. That has been part of the core of what my spiritual awakening has done. It's brought me 
deeper into alignment with Chris and within myself so that not only can I hold space from a higher perspective, but also be really grounded in this life experience that I get to be, ha that I get to have, you know? This is, I mean, you just blew my mind, first of all, because this is one of the things that I want to talk to you about. I find so often when I have these conversations with people, it's like the thing that I want to ask them about that I notice about them isn't just like this thing that happens to be, it's something that's really intentional. And so one of the things that I wanted to ask you about, th that is to me, one of the most amazing things about you is that you hold this like celebrity star quality, self-expression frequency, and you are so generous in celebrating other people and sharing your energy and uplifting others. And it's this beautiful mixing of energies. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. I'm receiving that. And that makes me feel so happy. I love, you know, as a lot of kids in the early 2000s, myself, I was just very enamored with celebrity culture. I live in Los Angeles. I was born and raised in Northern California, but I came to LA 16 years ago for school. And I think on a surface level, I was attracted to it, the attractive people and just like they seem, they're seemingly living interesting and exciting lives. And what I actually came into my discovery being able to, over the last 15 years, work for maybe 15 plus celebrities in different capacities is that we are all the star of our own lives. Marianne Williamson, she says this amazing thing is that we're so obsessed with celebrities and stars because we're not yet starring in our own life. And oh. what, I, right? what I've learned is that why we're attracted to that or why we create this bond is because they're evoking that higher nature of us. It's that they're right. just the embodiment of people that have lived or achieved more expanded realities. And there's that part of our divine being that's, I want that. I want more expansion. And it doesn't mean you want to have a million followers or live in a mansion. It means that there's a part of you that wants more. But what about this other piece that you're talking about? Because I think a lot of people think about celebrities or celebrity energy, and it's a in a very like me, look at me kind of way. And when you talk about this kind of energy of Oprah, where you've emptied yourself out and it's not about you, Talk about bringing that in. Talk about oh, all that, how that all fits together. Yes, I have a huge perspective about this. I really, truly, at the core of, of myself, I think the word fame, it has a frequency that people associate with like self-centeredness or arrogance or whatnot. But I've always just kind of shifted the idea of fame into visibility, which to me is service. So I think that when you are here and, you know, being able to have worked with the Kardashians, for instance, like part of what I'd done as a talent producer working with them is managing their digital presences through their blog websites and their social media. And this was about like uh, 10 years ago. But even then, oh my God, the amount of like fan mail that they would get and just sort of letters and DMs and messages from fans saying things like, oh, I don't have a family, so I love just looking at your family or I have a strained relationship with my parents or my siblings. And so your family gives me hope. And essentially, oh, while God. we're very you know, famous, we, we know the energetics of wealth creation. It's giving and receiving are, are the same. And so they're giving so much access to themselves, to their personal lives and just like the inspiration every day, posting and giving them you know, literally no privacy. And in that, it's, it's no question why they're billionaires or multimillionaires, because they're receiving so much energy in, in the form of love. And so in my opinion, what, if you are at some level of public notoriety or even just within your own community, that is a service. And that is really, to me, like a level of like, even I want to say like discipleship, depending on what your message is or what transmission you're putting out there. If it's that frequency of love consciousness, the more visible, the more expanded, the more lifted you are, the more ripples of good and power and service and prosperity you get to create through you being quote unquote famous. So I, and I've seen it in so many different cases with other celebrities where it's like them just showing up and being in their authenticity literally saves lives. It, it turns oh more God. from going on that path or going on that path, you know, and I know you and I both experienced that just even from coaching and just, you know, sharing our truths, right? Yeah. Yeah. A million percent. I feel like I've, this is going to be one of those conversations that I listened to three times to get all the tidbits and all the wisdom. And it's interesting what you're saying about this too, because 
I feel like every time I tune into your Instagram, you're on a stage or you're speaking somewhere, you're doing something, which is so amazing. But I also get this sense that having a voice and having that reach and that impact is really important to you. I feel like you treat it as something sacred. Would you say that? Yes. I mean, I, I feel like for a long time, I didn't really receive that gift. I, I obviously, I, I think that, you know, God gives us gifts that we're meant to share. But the the hardest part that most of us go through on our spiritual journeys is to actually receive it. And to, by that, I mean, to know the value and the, the worth of what you are here to bring to the world. And so I think oftentimes I, I would kind of, or on an egoic level, I would diminish. Oh, Chris, no one wants to hear you. Or, it doesn't matter, you know, shine your light or whatnot. And I, I do think that it's that like incessant voice that God texting you, blowing up your phone, calling you repeatedly to expand and to share that truth. And so for me now, I'm definitely coming into a season of where we're at a time, we're at this juncture, this pivot where I believe more of us are awakening to a level of visibility and of empowerment, personal empowerment, and to be able to, I call this the first lit birthday candle, is that we are the first lit birthday candles, those of us that are rising up. And when you light a birthday cake, you have one lit candle, and then that goes and lights all of the other ones. Oh on my goodness. So, I, you know, to me, I think that's, that is a sacred duty to be able to share your truth of love and yeah. for that ignite others. Oof, ignite's one of my favorite words lately. <laughs> yeah, it's totally, it is totally that, isn't it? And I think it takes a lot of courage. Like it takes a lot of courage to go first and to be different and to speak and to, yeah, to be at the beginning of that wave. Oh my God, it does. It, and you know, I think that I had played with this. This is very relatively new just here in my awakening journey, but I'm all about oftentimes I'm moving into the space of just collapsing duality and just being in the identity of pure awareness. And I right. know I'm here to experience reality through this, the shell of Chris, but in that more expanded state, I move into this space of, am I living my highest timeline? Am mm. I showing up to the highest version of God-given potentiality within me here in the now moment? And from that point of power, I just kind of give no fuck. I'm like, it doesn't matter. We're all just at the playground playing shit. We're trying stuff. And there's some horrible things happening here in the world. But wherever you have your point of power and point of privilege, I'm like, oh, that the blessings in my life and unfoldment has afforded me the possibility to still rise up and to still shine my light, no matter how difficult life might be. And so I'm in this point of, okay, cool. If I come into this divine beingness and seeing this entire stage as a playground, I'm like, no, let's have some fun. Let's actually just start a podcast, have your own show, you know, dress in a colorful outlet. Oh, okay. fucking lights up your soul. You know, that's I'm just living in that frequency at the moment. <laughs> that's it, though. And I feel like I received that from you without like any there was no coaching around or anything. We were just in conversation. But I, I remember it like it was just it was just landing. It was landing. And it's so funny. To, it's hilarious to think now. But the, like this blue light right here, like I have this tiny little blue highlight on my face. And I was when I first set this up, I was like, is that too edgy? If I have blue on my face and then now it's, I'm full of like gold all over the Internet, like sure. I, but I really feel like I can't. This is the thing. This is the thing about energetic codes. I can't even fully put it into words. But I think we were on a conversation one time and I was still really in that kind of coach therapist paradigm. And I just got this vision of being free and traveling and being like covered in glitter and dancing and like doing the magic work and healing people. There's like this sense of freedom. And I remember saying that to you and you were like, yes, you were like, that's you. That's you. And I just I feel like I received that from the most beautiful gift from you in that moment. I guess. I mean, honestly, I feel like you are the medicine. That's just sort of like you are the healing. And when I was working with Marianne Williamson, at one point, she had a joint event with Eckhart Tolle. And so they had the speaking event. And it was so funny because it wasn't, it was a, a relatively big auditorium room, but it wasn't massive. But I just remember like just being in the vibrational vicinity of Eckhart and the air felt like it felt like he had already just, it wasn't about what he was saying verbally. It was just this healing field that he had created from the frequency that he was holding, he calls himself frequency holder. And so I 100% believe that is that like when you in kind of in the space of Oprah, right? It's like 
people that go to her couch or go into an interview, they don't they don't go into the interview thinking that they're going to reveal everything to Oprah. But because she has this frequency in which, you know, she's very comforting and nurturing, then everyone just spills all of their juice to her. But it's pretty much that. It's like when you're in the vibrational vicinity of a celebrity, of a star, of just somebody else like yourself and, you know, us both being creatives, it's that we're giving people permission, like you said, through a code. It's just this like subconscious permission for them to shine their light brighter. That something just landed for me. And that was, I, yeah, a hundred percent. That's a hundred percent what it is. I never, I've thought about frequency holders and I recently, because a lot of the personal development stuff that I've been to has been online because of COVID and everything. And so I went to the first in-person thing recently and I really felt the difference in energy and being there. But I never thought about all of the, like when you say you are the medicine and all of those different kind of like personal frequencies that we hold, like it really is incredible. And something that connected when you were talking about people spilling their guts to Oprah is one of the things that people always say to me is I never open up this much or I never cry or I never say all these things. And people always say there's like something about your energy that makes me open up. And I just, I feel like you just expand. Yeah, I don't know. Something just connected from you when you were talking about all that, because that is totally what it is. I, I honestly think it's that part of us that are on the awakening path that are doing this work. And I mean, healing generational trauma or just like shifting timelines or whatnot, like all of that is, it is a sacred responsibility, but also it's a sacred duty in a sense, because as we are moving and we're ascending into higher frequencies, you're a proxy for God. I, it's like a God frequency. It's unconditional love, right? And so for you to be this beacon of light and for somebody to be able to divulge and to share their truth with you in the presence of being seen, being witnessed by you, you are automatically healing that. And so I've noticed that just as a music artist, like one other example is I went to an Alanis Morissette concert recently, This maybe a year ago, but holy shit, like just the way that her, her voice was just like reverberating throughout. She has that signature yodel. I'm like, she's omitting a frequency that is literally healing the Hollywood Bowl, 20,000 people. Right now. <laughs> I'm just like, that's her power. And that's her. Yeah. All of us, whether it's auditory through public speaking or through music, or it's like through your book, a book is a frequency through your art and art is a frequency. So all of that has massive potential for healing. I think there's, it's so interesting that you're talking about art and music, because I think something that I've been really tapping into recently is this connection between, I don't even know what to call it. It's like between creativity and I want to say like our divine, our authenticity, like our mission, our per like all of these things. And it's kind of come through in a couple different ways. Like one is I've been becoming more and more tuned into just all the different energy centers, like the chakras and been noticing because in, in that whole understanding of things, the where the creative energy is literally life force energy, right? It's like creativity, yeah. sexuality, life force energy. Yeah. They're all like kind of one chakra. And then also, this is kind of funny. You, I remember you encouraged me to read that book I think it's the Ricky Rubin book and I was like I'm not gonna read it and then Natalie was reading it and then I was like I'm still not gonna read it and then this passage from it forced its way into my life it was the universe was like you have to have this information and it was this quote from it something like it's not about forcing yourself to create it's about living in the exquisite state where creation is inevitable and I think there's I think there's yeah there's almost like this sacred link between creativity and healing and all of this other stuff that we're talking about. Yes. I think when people can, instead of like the label or the sort of like the bucket or this structure of what it means to be a, a creative, I think that when you can accept creativity as an aspect of the divine, then things get really fun because in Genesis in the Bible, create is the first active word in the Bible. So my belief is that creativity is a, it's a supernatural power. It's our divine power. And we know in conscious reality creation, we are like, yeah, we can create with our hands or we could write a book or make a podcast or whatnot, but our life is being created. We're creating it through our thoughts, feelings, beliefs. And so to me, I think that's the, that's the masterpiece. And it's like almost like a talent, as you're saying, just as we come into these emotions, that some of us aren't able to really feel or really understand is that 
the emotion is energy in motion. And so when you can use art as a conduit to reach people and to create connection and to bond people through storytelling, I think it's just so powerful. And just, I think that even just to use your gold, fierce glitter picture as an example is in, in some ways, something like just a photo of you being fully expressed or you being creatively expressed in that moment. I think that to me, that's the spiritual liberation work that we're doing. We've all heard the phrase about how hurt people hurt people, but I think free people free people. And I think that when you're in that frequency of spiritual liberation, of freedom, and then you can express that through your art. I think that, again, going back to celebrities, that's why so many people love them is because a lot of them, let's say like Nicki Minaj or Beyonce or whoever, they just are like being who they are. They're being big. They're not carrying the weight of shame that so many of us are coded and programmed into. And maybe they are behind the scenes, but their persona is able to transcend that, their public persona. And I think that's what gives people hope and inspires people. I'm like a million percent. I think sometimes that people that might not have the kind of perspective that we have might just think that all some of this sounds like very like airy fairy. I know I obviously don't mean that to criticism. I think it's been really interesting for me because I was in therapy world for a while and then it's really led to this. But what I find is this is what's on the other side of a healing journey. And I don't think that anyone really gets here without doing this deep inner healing work. And then I always say, this is kind of the fun part that's on the other side, right? I've actually regulated my nervous system. I've like cleared out the drama. I'm becoming the conscious creator of not just my life, but I feel like it's myself and life responds. You know, it's I'm intentionally in directing my energetic and emotional state. So do, like, do you feel like that's is that the path that you've experienced from this kind of healing to this liberation and freedom as you talk about? Yeah, I, I love this question because I think about it just from like Chris's like human. Um, right. Where I say that I've had to come out of the closet three times. So the <laughs> first time was like my sexuality. Hey guys, I'm gay. But the second time was I'm an artist. And I had already prior to that built this very like academic, professional Chris, valedictorian, to like getting two degrees from a university and all these different things. And then I'm like, hey guys, sorry, I'm a sexy pop star. That's who I am. And then now, honestly, it's uh, being a spiritualist or being a spiritual leader. And a lot of that is up against where the times are, right? And I think like you just, you mentioned mental health and, and therapy. And it's funny because oh, it's only been within this last decade that people go to therapy as just like routine, you know, helping themselves mental health there's there's no issues or problems it's just yeah. you, it's like having a personal trainer for your brain and that is actually moving now into to the spiritual health space where that is actually going to be the next wave and right now some of us feel like we're on the fringes and we're like woo woo or we're mystics or whatever but harvard researchers are starting to see now that spirituality is not only integral for chronic disease but for overall health and that there's all these polls where 41% of American adults are saying that they have a spiritual awakening symptoms, which equates to over 100 million Americans. So this is not a small, like, we are all going through this and feeling stuff that we don't really, we can't fully understand. And maybe science has the key, maybe religion or spirituality or whatnot, but that's what we're all trying to discover and figure out. Totally. And this is really interesting. And I can't be too specific, obviously, because of confidentiality, but I have had a number of very successful, either from psychology backgrounds or very academic clients that have come to me because they have become more spiritual and they've you know, they're in a, some kind of leadership role. And it's basically this thing where they intuitively know that this, what they found is more powerful and more real and more effective than, you know, this like academia, whatever they were taught. But there's often this, this unconscious thing that, which of course is my freaking wheelhouse, but it's fascinating how many clients I've had that have come specifically for that. I want to speak this. I want to share this truth. I want to, you know, be this channel and tap into my more intuitive self. But there's this piece where, and they can't even put their finger on it, which is why it's unconscious that it's not okay to diverge from academia, even though they consciously see 
that there's more. So I'm so happy that you referenced the Harvard study. I see it in my work as well. Even though I already know it, there's something about it that's kind of reinforcing, right? It's, I'm not the only one. <laughs> I think it's honestly amazing. And that's why, as you said earlier, like I'm so passionate about being in community with this next generation of spiritual leaders or people that are, are stepping into that space very boldly, unbridledly, just fully. And a lot because for me, I feel a little bit lucky in a sense is that through my awakening journey, I was supported through like the resources that I had, the coaches, the therapy, all of the different like people that came into my life. But I also recognize that is still it's still not the norm for people as while well, the online space has opened it up for a lot of people throughout the world. People are still sort of confined to what their practice of, of healing needs to look like or you know, or even something as simple of like people that are very in bondage in terms of, oh, I have to stay in this career or I have to yeah. like in this life path, right? Which there's this part of us uh, in Maslow's hierarchy of human need. The top of the pyramid is the desire to become one's most self. It's self-actualization. And so not only is it in our human DNA, but it's in our spiritual DNA to evolve. But so many of us are still in bondage from who we think we have to be. And I believe that, you know, if you're Beyonce, you're a spiritual leader because she's at the edge. She's on the outer edges of creation and imagination. And that in itself is spiritual. Totally. It's like leading the way and breaking those shackles. And I think that sort of like deconditioning or the re-offering to people of choice is how I think about it. It's they think there's no choice, but there actually is. And it's the giving back of that is actually one of the most powerful things. But yeah, it's just so... It's like the feeling that I get when I think about it, it's so many people are in this fixed, this kind of fixed energy. And I was in that. And I had kind of had this like real run when I was younger. I was really successful as a choreographer. I did some really big things. I accomplished the things. And then I kind of had this, you know, ex-football syndrome where it was like, that was it. I reached the peak of my life and this is it. And it just felt like layers of settling. And this is all that life was going to be. And I, I think it's so easy to get into that, right? And and you're right, There there are celebrities and so many people and things. And I think that's really, if you boil it down, that's kind of what the spiritual awakening does in a way. It, it breaks you out of who you thought you were supposed to be and wakes you up to who you are. Yes. I mean, honestly, I feel like that's why I'm grateful that even our stories really reflected and mirrored and intersected at a certain time. Because I think oh as we move in this fractal line, right, all of us are really helping to reflect and to show everyone else that it's safe, right? And yeah. in every I always go back to the word inspiring because inspiring means in spirit. And so when somebody's living that inspiring life, it's just that you can feel the spiritual texture of their essence and the way of being that they've embodied, right? And so as we move and we play together and we create together, it somehow unlocks this permission slip that our inner child needs, that it's almost a reminder that it's safe to be yourself. It's safe to be big. It's safe to shine your light. And I think that, again, that there's this nefarious programming that's wanting to keep us in that more small version of who we're being told that we have to be in order to be safe. That spiritual texture that you can feel. Ooh, I love the language around that. Do you feel like that that's something that you play with? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I feel like my soul, it's so funny because you go through this journey and then you're like, there's no way I agreed to that. And then you go into meditation. You're like, yeah, my soul definitely agreed to the things where like I have like all of this, these personal pursuits of how expanded I want to be as a music artist, as a soon to be reality star and just all these different things yes. that I do and be. However, the way that my life had unfolded was that I had to align higher consciousness and spirituality and love consciousness to that purpose. And when I see it, I'm like back, if let's say I had massive success or fame like 10 years ago, it would have definitely been under the influence of my ego. And I'm not saying that from a bad way, but I just know that the impact and the ripple of service and prosperity that I could actually give to the world would be so much. And I think that now having gone through the spiritual awakening, there's this there's almost this badge of honor that I can now fully receive where I now understand that anything that I do, whether it's within my business, like as a music artist or in the activist and social impact space, all of that matters. Like all of it gets to belong. It all gets to be integrated in a way because as God consciousness, like there's no limits, there's no boundaries or, you know, 
there's no rules, so to speak. And so I think that part of even as these new leaders are awakening into into in society, it, there's also this excitement around for me, like not necessarily dismantling, but really evolving what we think of as a spiritual leader. It's not just Deepak or Eckhart or, you know, the guru in Lotus Pose. It's like you get to be a spiritual leader as an author, as a speaker, as a pop star, as a mother, as a teacher, whatever. It doesn't matter. I think that we are all called in our own ways to spread love. That process that you're talking about, that time where you're like, if it had come then, there would have been too much ego and it would have limited. What would you say to someone that's like working through that time themselves? Oh my God, I love this question because it's so funny. Obviously being a California kid and just like having lived that experience, I also went to USC, which is, it's infamously called the University of Spoiled Children. There's like a lot <laughs> of kids trust funds there. And so when you're surrounded and working with celebrities, but I like that level of like wealth creation and abundance and affluence, I think that there's this idea that, oh, that's the straight shot. Okay, this is what we're here to do. And this is like the conquest, right? But we know in the Bible, what it says is that seek ye first the kingdom of God and those things will be added on to you. And so that's not obviously the way that modern society works. We're seeking our wholeness and our love in separation. We're seeking it in all of these experiences outside of us. And what I had to realize was that if I had done that and if I had continued on that path, the ego, my ego would have been insatiable, right? Like I would have just been like, oh yeah, more Birkins, more Louis Vuitton bags, like more, it just would have just, it's honestly uncontrollable. I am surrounded by people with massive amounts of following, of fame, of like everything. And it's always like, the next best thing. What's the next thing I need? And yeah. part of what the spiritual awakening did, it, you know, it really showed me that like this path of wholeness, of happiness, you joy that you want to call it, like it's really from a sense of letting go, of surrender, of trust. It's not manifestation culture, which it is now, and you and I are privy to it, where it's let's like bolster and barrel through and get our desires and you know i yeah. mean i'm for that at the same time i'm like sometimes the ego just needs to like be dissolved in order for yeah. you to see there do you feel like that happened in layers oh my god yes and it's still happening i was gonna say it's <laughs> i feel it's never ending. huh no you go ahead you go ahead yeah i was just saying like, it's my awakening started about eight years ago and so now oh my god my ego is so for lack of a better phrase, it's so beaten down in the best way possible that like it's dissolved to a certain level where even if I have a moment where I'm like stressed out or frustrated or really attached to an outcome in a relationship or, you know, with business or something that I'm pursuing, it's dissolved enough for me to still hold that expanded awareness to receive and to understand that like my value is coming from within. It's always like creation mm. is an echo of what I have inside. And so it doesn't mean that I won't continuously go down the rabbit hole or go down the, the road to go and try to get that stuff. But I always, I can now recognize much quicker that the fruit that I'm actually looking for is within. Cool. It was probably one of the most life-changing moments for me when I, when that really hit. There's these things that we're aware of that's hard to articulate, but I know exactly what you mean. I feel it like differently in my body. Ever since that really landed, the value comes from within. And I think we hear that as a concept so much, but I think when it really lands, I think it changes, it changes everything. Yeah. I mean, I think about that moment where we were going to record a podcast or we were doing something together. And like before that, you were on a boat with your friends. Oh, I'm yeah, just yeah. Like, I'm on a boat, like whatever, you know. And I'm like, that's what I'm saying is actually what people think that they want, whether it's like a million dollars or a mansion or whatever, these things outside of them, is that like in your present moment, like the fullness of life exists in this now moment. And so because you've also done this work to close the gap between your higher self and your ego, you can feel the fullness of everything you need by I'm going to go on a boat with my friends and that's going to be so fun. Or, you know, for me, I'm like, honestly, if I go or some, it could be something so simple. I was eating a poke bowl the other day and I was just like, I was just like, so in the love frequency based on like how good this poke bowl was. I had two, honestly, I ordered two. And I was just like so obsessed with it. And it was just like that is something that like some billionaires don't even have. They don't have that ability 
to feel that level of gratitude and love with a present experience, oftentimes because what they're pursuing is still in possession of them, meaning their ego is still driving the steering wheel. Totally. It's such an interesting relationship with ego, I think. I don't know if you identify with any of this, but I think for me, because I was a performer, right? And it was very, there was that kind of look at me energy and it was just part of it. And then I, when I stopped being a dancer and I became like a normal person, people didn't like that. I feel like there was shame around that. And so I just, it was like, I suppressed all of it. And then I think in the claiming of me and my full expression of self, there's feels like a reactivating of some of that energy because it's part of who I am. But then the refinement process of, okay, I'm going to hold this where, like you said, I can have my flashy gold photos and have these moments where I'm like really feeling myself with the camera and just, yeah, this energy, this performance energy, let's call it, but also holding, which is so important to me, is this compassion and this love frequency and this awareness that's so beyond, beyond myself. And I think before I stepped into this realm of awareness, it was like, I just thought about, it was like all black and white. I guess. Do you identify with any of that? Oh my God, of course. There's this There's this passage within The Course in Miracles. They talk about grandeur and grandiosity. And, uh, grandiosity is of the ego, but grandeur is of the spirit. And so honestly, it is this fine line, right? And it is part of our spiritual practice to really like you. I like that you use the word refine to really refine the edges of what sort of intention am I moving from? But I think that's where people get really confused because in their, in some people's minds, they think, oh, well, I'm going to swing back to the opposite extreme and be shy and modest and like overly humble. And so the, the Course in Miracles resolves that by saying that grandeur is of, of the spirit. It's honor, it's reverence, it's devotion to who you were called to be. If we knew that, if we believe that God is this masterful artist and he doesn't create worthless things, then why would we then ascribe to ourselves that our lives is worthless or that what we are here to do is worthless? And we are here to stand in the reverence and that honor and that devotion of our bigness. And in doing so, we get to reflect and embody this frequency, like you said, this light to really shine to others. And so I think I'm just having worked with celebrities, working with people like you, I'm like, bigger everyone go bigger yeah. it's like spiritual leaders if that is your mission that us playing small marianne williamson says this that you're playing small doesn't serve the world and i think that we've somehow misinterpreted this idea of ego honestly i've ego is just being identified with the body and enlightenment is being identified with spirit but there is this masterful dance that gets to happen between your higher self god and its creation in this very harmonic masterpiece of expression. So I believe that they have, they come together in, in the best way possible. Yeah. I love that we're talking about this and this, what you said about most people just turn it back off. That's, I talk about this so much in my work. It's, that's the easiest thing to do. Just shut down a whole part of yourself. But I think that's part of reintegration and becoming whole is becoming one with all of these shadow parts. And, and sometimes, you know, another big thing for me was like I had just completely repressed anger. So there was a lot of anger in my household growing up and it was just anger led to reactivity. But when you, it's like you suppress the whole anger stack, but what anger is connected to is also passion and grit and things that you really care about. And so the real work to me is having that energy online and be a part of you and refining it. So I can be passionate about something, but it can be directed in a positive way or for the good and it's for my good and the, the, the good of the world. And I just love what you said about, you know, just turning it all off and going back to being shy rather than going, okay, let me refine this and find that fine line between grandeur and grandiose, which is such an incredible way to put it. Yeah. I think there's this like really cool and it's nuanced and you get to play with it and you'd be like, oh yeah, I pushed it too far. Oh yeah. yes. I was, I put that thirst trap online so I could get people to <laughs> <laughs> to like look at me or get that attention that's fine I'm not shaming any of that but what I had learned in my own journey is that a lot of what I was doing when I was moving through this was my way of navigating through internalized shame and which is shame is the emotional signature of not enoughness mm. and when I kind of shifted that through my spiritual awakening and this journey with God I actually can now see it through authenticity 
And so that is like what you're saying is that honestly, think about a, a, a child before they're coded, before they're absorbed, all of the programming of this world. They're just singing and dancing. They don't feel self-conscious. They're just in their authentic flair. And I think that part of what we're here to do as spiritual leaders is to return to love, is to return back to the true essence of our divine beingness, which is being fucking fabulous, wearing glitter and like Chanel. It's yes. Well, I think about so many of those things lived inside my soul. And how sad would it be if I lived my whole life and I never let them come out, you know? Oh my goodness. So, so good. So good. And I, I love when you talk about this. It's okay that you did this. And sometimes I push it too far. Do you think not being afraid of that and then being able to self-reflect is an important part of that whole process for you? Yeah, I honestly think that for me, where love is really showing up, especially in my creative process right now, but also just like adulting and just learning to navigate the human experience is meeting every aspect of self with love. And so part mm -hmm. of it also realizing that I am this I am not. And at the same time, I still I still get to be like this, the fullness of Chris. And then I also get to hold awareness to that and be like, okay, cool. Let's go in this other direction, right? That was like where we want to go next. And so I think where I'm at now is just like divinity is really just unfolding in such a way where it's like, there's no mistakes like that. And I think that's, I had lived under this like internal shaming, which a lot of gay people do or, you know, queer kids like is like, oh, you're being too much or don't stick out or, yeah. oh my God, you wear that, like you're going to get bullied or whatever. And so some of that like still runs with me when I'm in a board meeting or I'm on stage or I'm speaking. But I think that's just, again, an opportunity for me to transcend, to move through that with love and to really tell myself again that, it, that I am here, as you were saying, to be the fullest version of myself. Am I living in my highest timeline? I think it's such a it's such a, an important thing that all of us really on the spiritual journey are awakening to and asking ourselves. And I think that even that inquiry is really what God is wanting us to do. Oh my God, so good. This is That's going to be the title of this episode, Living yes. Your Highest Timeline. <laughs> I love it. Yes. And so I still, <laughs> the creation is, you know, we all know that like, creation is finished in a sense but even as it's unfolding here in this timeline i'm like oh there's still more for us to do and i think that's part of what i'm hoping that the new spiritual conversation is moving toward is that part of us gets to really as we've transcended our suffering it's to not just unpack and live there and do shadow work for the rest of our existence on this planet it's no it's like you get to be the embodiment of the divine which means you are creating to the highest levels of expression and prosperity and love and abundance. And so that's why I'm so against anything that sort of is speaking small mindedness or or lack into people, because I'm like, that is not the expression of at least the God that I subscribe to. Yeah, I, I love that so much. And I, I love what you're saying, too, about I mean, that, that's kind of what I was trying to say earlier. This is what's on the other side of all that healing and all that shadow work. And I feel like sometimes it's like we spend so much time there. And then we get so used to looking to the past and looking to the trauma. And it's like, okay, there comes a time where you're mostly healed. But now it's fun. Now it gets to be, this is the free. Now it's to be you. I literally yelled that at a class. I did not yell at it, but at a class the other day, they were asking all these really heavy questions. I was like, you guys, everybody in here is so advanced. You've all done so much work. You're in control of your energy field. You're in control of your intentions. This is the fun part. Have fun that you get to co-create with the universe your life. And they were all like, that's this. We've got to get out of that, like, healing paradigm and into that fully expressed energy and truth of who we are. And I just, I feel like that's, that to me is who you are. Your presence is that medicine, is that magic to me. So. My God, thank you. Yeah. There, there is that sort of insidious part of our ego that's, oh, I got to heal this. I got to do more. I got to yeah. do one more course or I need to go do this next thing or whatever. And, and sometimes there is that, right. But oh yeah, like, when it comes down to it, it's that, that, I had learned this thing through Eckhart, actually, just reading his book. He says that the ego recreates the suffering it thinks it deserves. So it's only until you transcend the part of your ego that realizes, I don't have to keep suffering. But right. us on the spiritual journey, because we're like, you know, in the savior martyrism, it's no, at some point, you, it's up to you to transcend. You're holding the key. Walk out of the prison cell. 
on my awakening, I've walked out of the prison cell and walked right back in because that was what I had known. I just had known suffering. And so the ego, remember this, it's like the ego recreates the suffering it thinks it deserves. Once you literally realize my true divine nature does not need to suffer, you get to completely detach from it and move on. Those stories no longer hold their power and they just enjoy. That was some epic wisdom. Yeah, that was so good. I've done the same thing when you talk about going, yeah, to, going, I have, the same. I, have the I mean, I have the gravestones of, of past exes, to ex boyfriends to look behind in terms of the suffering that I kept recreating. It's repetition compulsion. It's totally. I didn't know until I was like, I don't have to suffer anymore. Oh my goodness. So good. Amazing. It's been such a pleasure having you here. I'll ask you in a second where people can find you, but any final thoughts, any final things you want to share with us? No, I think like for me, just like, thank you so much for having me. I, I told you right before we started recording was like, I don't know what's going to come out, but I think it's going to be fun and it's going to be exactly what needs to come out. And for me, again, just being able to just be in conversation and in community with people like yourself, to me, that's my biggest joy. I, when I had started my journey in the self-development space, I basically had a silent prayer to God and it was, God, I want to have the coolest spiritual Avenger friends all around the world. And, you know, he's fulfilled that prayer 10 times over. And so I'm just always in solidarity with people that are doing whatever work at whatever stage in their journey they are at. And that it's not this, oh, I have to run up the hill and fucking push this rock up the mountain myself. It's that actually when we start to share these conversations, I hope that we're inviting a sense of belonging to something greater than ourselves and that we are creating a, a movement of love unlike it's ever been expressed before on the planet. And so I'm just excited and thankful to, to be able to share this conversation of higher consciousness with you. Oh my goodness. Same. Thank you. I wasn't sure if I was going to share this on the podcast or not, but I feel like you just opened the door. So I definitely, as I've been going through my own levels of awakening, have been shifting and there's been a lot of changing in the people that are around me. And I, I have been feeling kind of lonely, especially in like my real life space, like who I'm actually in. But it's funny, I was thinking about this when you're talking about the Poke Bowl. I got into this state the other day just of such gratitude of the people that are in my life, like whether they be online and that, you know, have come in. And I just I ended up like in tears with so much gratitude for the people. And you were one of the people that came through. I just really want to celebrate, you know, how grateful I am to have you in my life and, and how much you've impacted me and how much I just cherish our connection. So it is so felt. And yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, babe. And oh my God, I feel so excited. The Michael Edwards show. This is oh my goodness. <laughs> so thank you so much. Can't Amazing. And where can people find you? I'm on Instagram at Sir Chris Saint dot or at Sir Chris Saint is my handle. You can find my music, Sir Christopher Saint on Spotify. You can find just information about me on ChristopherJacobsay.com and just you'll find me find me through Michael we're in our we're friends on Instagram yeah I'll put all your I'll put all your links in the show notes you guys can check the show notes for more about Chris so Chris thank you again thank you everyone for joining us and listening today sending you so much love and bye for now bye guys